Is that my fault? I guess it was my fault. Um, ow, that hurt my side. <laughs> oh, all right, I'm getting old. Uh, a couple things to remind you of. We don't pass our offering plates anymore, but you can leave your uh, gift there to support our ministry. But there's also an uh, opportunity to give online and text to give number that comes up at that point in the service as well. Uh, we'd love it if you'd fill out the communication cards that are in your worship folder, particularly if you have a prayer request. Those will be uh, given to us, and we'll make use of them um, during our time of prayer as well. Those are picked up during the children's message. Um, and as always, if you're watching our live stream, we'd love it if you would share that you're uh, with your family and friends, that they might be blessed as well. Let's take a moment again uh, to stand, greet one another, particularly look for some f unfamiliar faces. Introduce yourself as we uh, begin our worship today. You don't have to sit up here, you know. But you wanted to. Good morning, I'm Molly. Please join me in singing the first hymn. Good, good morning, I'm Molly. Please join me in singing the first hymn. Please stand. Transfiguration Sunday, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us take a time uh, for our opening sentences. Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house. This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's take a brief moment for self-reflection of our sins of this past week. Almighty God, merciful Father, that we are by nature sinful and unclean, that we announced you in thought, word, and deed, and by what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not you alone. 
Jesus came down from the Mount of Transfiguration even though he knew his disciples would forsake and deny him. He went to the cross so that he could offer us all full and free forgiveness. As I called and ordained servant of the word, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. For peace, despite our past mistakes. For peace to hear God speaking to us in this time of worship. For peace that we may be living stones in God's house. Let us continue with the glory in excelsior. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, in the glorious transfiguration of your beloved Son, you confirm the mysteries of the faith by the testimony of Moses and Elijah. In the voice that came from the bright cloud, you wonderfully foreshadowed our adoption by grace. Mercifully make us co heirs with the King in his glory and bring us to the fullness of our inheritance in heaven. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
children's message? guys awake? Working on it? That's it. Any birthdays coming up? None. You guys are very responsive today. All right. So I have a problem. Can you hold this one? And can you hold this one? I have baking soda and baking powder, but I don't know which one's which. Can you guys hold those up? Do they look different? No, they look exactly the same, right? But I need baking powder to make a cake, because the recipe specifically calls for baking powder. So I have a test to determine which one's baking soda and which one's baking powder. You can, thank you for holding that up. You can put your arm, thank you. Um, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna put some white vinegar in this cup, and if it's baking soda, it should bubble up and fizz when we put it into the vinegar. And if it's baking powder, it won't react, okay? Sawyer, can you hold this for me? Okay, you guys decide, are we gonna try the blue or the red? You wanna try the blue? So we're gonna see if this one's baking soda first. So now I know that this one's the baking powder that I need for the cake. So I gotta remember, red is the best way to go always. <laughs> yeah, see what I did there? So now that I know, it's really important to know what to use, right? It has the right ingredients. Here, you can put those in there if you want. You gotta have the right ingredients to make the cake. We all, as people, want to know things all the time, right? Car mechanics need to know how a car works in order to fix it, right? Doctors need to know how a body works in order to help people heal. And uh, it got me thinking about our story today. Um, we have Jesus and his disciples, and his disciples are like, not quite sure who this guy that they've been hanging out with is, right? He uh, um, has done miracles, and he's done some cool stuff, but they don't know who Jesus is, right? Until he goes up on a mountain with a couple of his disciples, and he actually transforms on the mountain, much like this baking soda transformed in the vinegar. I imagine it's exactly the same thing. And Jesus transformed into this big white light, and Moses and Elijah were with him, and God actually comes down and says, this is my son, referring to Jesus. This is my son, listen to him. And it, I don't know that it gets more clear than God directly saying who Jesus is, right? So now they know Jesus is their son. But how do we know who Jesus is. How do we know that Jesus came and died on the cross and took on our sins and rose again and conquered death all so that we could be forgiven? How do we know that? What do you think? Oh, you weren't raising your hand? Okay. Yeah. So that's what we believe he did, right? And truth be told, there's not necessarily a scientific discovery to know for sure that that's what he did. But we have faith, right? We believe in Jesus. We believe that he did that. And with that comes trust, right? Believing in that he is who he says he is. And um, that because of that, we believe what the Bible tells us about who Jesus is, right? So having that faith and that belief is what's super important. And I want you guys to remember that this week as you pester your parents with lots of questions. Remember that Jesus knows us and that we know who Jesus is because we have faith in him. Can you do that? All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for loving us, that you came down into this world and for, um, died on the cross so that our sins might be forgiven. Help us to remember how much you love us and to show that love out to the world. In your name we pray, amen. All right, you guys can head back. Thanks so much.
next time. <laughs> the Old Testament reading for today is from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 34, verses 1 through 12. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Fizkiah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land, Gilead as far as Dan, and Naphtali, and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, and the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the Negeb, the plains that is the valley of Jericho, and the city of palm trees as far as Zor. And the Lord said to him, This is the land which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to your offspring. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Poer. But no one knows the place of his burial to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was undimmed and his vigor unabated. The people of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. So the people of Israel obeyed him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. And there had not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. None like him for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants, to all his land. And for all the mighty power and all the great deeds of terror that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. The epistle reading for today is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus had been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house, if indeed we hold fast to our confidence and our boasting in our hope. This is the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Gospel reading according to the ninth chapter of Luke, reading from verse 28. Now, about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. As he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days of anything of what they had seen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, 
by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. come. Amen. Amen. Let us remain standing. Let us remain standing for our sermon hymn for today. Please join me in singing. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Lesson for today is uh, from the Gospel, Luke chapter 9, particularly these words. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. You may be seated. So uh, today is Transfiguration Sunday, and uh, if you're not familiar, uh, kind of with the church calendar, this is the, the day when we... Um, start making the transition from the season of Epiphany, uh, the season where um, the ministry of Jesus is revealed and the, the things that he teaches and says and does, uh, to the season of Lent, uh, where we contemplate uh, his sacrifice for us leading up to the celebration of Easter. But Transfiguration serves as kind of this um, uh, Sunday that appears as a reminder, right, that we actually know at the end of the story. It, uh, it takes place as where you hear this opportunity where Three of the disciples are allowed to see Jesus in all of his glory. And, and I chose this title, this, uh, this concept that it's too good to stay. Now, I don't know if you ever stopped and thought about that, if that was possible, right? Um, if we have experiences in our life that are, that are so great that our reaction is we can't keep doing them. You ever thought about that? Like there's some obvious ones, right? Like maybe you go on a vacation. Uh, Julie and I have had a, a couple of uh, uh, times we've gone to, like, down to... Cancun and have, you know, stayed in an all-inclusive resort and that kind of thing. And it's pretty nice, but we've never really been like, we don't ever want to go back, right? In fact, I was starting to think about this. Um, you guys know that, that PJ has made his way through all of the 14ers in Colorado. Did you know that? And that was one of my goals, but I made the mistake. He was smart. I made the mistake of getting married. <laughs> so I don't have that kind of time in my life. But I want to show you, this is a picture from a, a long time ago. So I'm showing you this picture for two reasons. One, I think this is on Bierstadt. 
and I'm holding my, do you guys ever go to Witch Witch? You get a free sandwich if you take a picture with their bag, that's why I'm holding that bag. Now, I'm showing this for two reasons. One, you'll see I hardly have any facial hair. Look how terrible that looks. That's, what, that's what's gonna happen next week if you keep this up. That's what I, I'm gonna look that terrible, okay? Um, but the other reason I'm showing you this is, has anybody ever gone to the top of 14? Or you can even obviously drive or take rail cars to them. But so, I mean, that view is pretty amazing, isn't it? There, there's few things in the world that are like that. You just get there and you, you see just for miles and miles, you see the glory of God's creation. But in all the 14ers I've done, in all the 14ers you've done, PJ, have you ever seen anyone living up there? No one lives on top of a 14er. Isn't that interesting? One of the greatest views in all the world, but no one stays there. And that's because there are things in this world that, is, that are as great as they are, they are a temporary thing, a, a glimpse that we get. They're not the permanent thing, right? All of us who have experienced that at one time or another, we had to come down from the mountain and go someplace terrible. For me, last week, that was Nebraska. <laughs> As you may have seen from all the red in church today, um, we made a college visit last week and my daughter betrayed me <laughs> deep to my core and decided to attend the University of Nebraska, right? But it's a, it's a true reflection of life. There's glorious places like the mountains that we know we can't live and there's terrible places like Nebraska <laughs> that we sometimes have to live, right? Now, I'm just going to bring this up one more time. For, for all the people who are from Nebraska and tell me it's so great, then why are you here? <laughs> why did you leave there to come here? That's just my only question. All right? Um, but the truth is we can't, we can't stay in those moments, right? Those, those high places, as much as we want to, as much to, to kind of experience them forever, they, we can't do it. We have to go back to kind of everyday, ordinary, real life. And so what's interesting is to kind of consider the whole entire purpose, not just that Luke tells us this story, the other, two of the other gospel writers tell it as well, but, but not just why he tells the story, but, but why does it happen at all? Well, what's the purpose of Jesus giving this kind of, kind of glimpse at all? And I don't know if you, uh, you thought about it, but this text started today with this. Now, about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and James and John. Um, eight days after what? So we actually need a little bit of context for, the, for um, Luke chapter 9. These are all the things that have preceded the transfiguration. There's the feeding of the 5,000. Anybody ever heard of that? Yeah, that's kind of an important event in, uh, in Jesus' ministry. It brings about this, this question that Peter then answers, right? You remember Jesus asked Peter, who do the people say I am, right? And then he asked, but who do you say I am? And of course, Peter actually gets, uh, um, gets an answer right for once, right? He says, Christ, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then Jesus predicts his death. He tells them that he will go to Jerusalem, he'll be betrayed, and he'll die, but after three days rise again. But they don't understand what that means, right? They're confused by it. And he points out to them that to follow him means to take up your cross, so it's actually important that we have this in, in the back of our mind as we kind of wrestle with and, and try to figure out what's taking place here uh, for Jesus. Because he's, he's been conveying to them and trying to show to them that while the, um, the promise that he holds out is, of course, the promise that God has made from the very beginning, it still is true that we live in these times and in these moments where it doesn't seem like it. Right? We become prisoners, we become captured uh, prisoners of the moment. I don't know about you, but um, I, th I thought about this uh, again last week. Are you familiar with the, uh, the Chinese curse that says, may you live in interesting times? Like, I don't know about you, but that's, I, someone has cursed us, haven't we? Like, just, just when we're getting done with one crazy thing in the world, something else happens, right? War breaks out. And, and we can get caught up in this. Uh, this kind of uh, moment, which is understandable, but we can become prisoners where we think all that's happening is, is about right now. But if you're a student of history, you actually kind of look back and realize, oh no, it's, it's always been this way, right? There's always been tumult, there's always been trials, there's been tribulations, there's, there's not, it's not easy, right, to live in this world. 
to make our way through this, this broken, broken world. And, and then when it, it, it seeps into our lives as well, it can make these, um, the, the, the thoughts in our minds question if God's really, really in control. Does he really know what he's doing? Does he really, really have a plan? And so when Jesus lays out that, that part of discipleship is to suffer, to take up your cross, to, to bear burdens, they, they don't understand what it means. And so Jesus takes just three of them. Have you ever wondered what it's like to be the others, the other nine? Every time Jesus takes the three away, aren't you like, jerks, right? How come? That's right, fear of missing out. That was the first one. Yep, and so they're, um, the, the others are left behind, but Jesus goes up onto the mount, and we're told that he appears in his glory. In fact, um, if you want something kind of fun one time, go read the very beginning of the book of Revelation where Jesus is described in his glory and compare it to this text is quite uh, interesting. And so what happens is we see Jesus is revealed in his glory, but kind of a, amazing with him is that Moses and Elijah are there as well. And they speak of his, your English said, departure. But that word that's used there um, is the same word that they used in the Greek Septuagint. That's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible for Exodus. Moses and Elijah are there speaking with Jesus about his Exodus. Jesus's Exodus. Isn't that interesting? So what, what do you think? I mean, anybody want to eavesdrop on that conversation? What would it been? What would, what could they have possibly been saying? Right? Could Moses and Elijah impart to anything that Jesus, that he didn't already know? Giving him new information? No. Uh, Moses and Elijah are in heaven, so they already have sort of the knowledge that comes with being with, with the God and creator of all things, right? So they're speaking of his exodus, but for what purpose? It's kind of interesting because as the story unveils, there's some other sort of strange things that take place as well. Has anyone ever noticed that the disciples are always tired? Why are they always falling asleep, right? And at terrible times. They're on top of a mountain where Jesus is transfigured in their into his glory, and they are falling asleep. What kind of work does Jesus have them doing? That they're tired of? Remember the Garden of Gethsemane? Jesus is praying, they can't even stay awake. So, I mean, then we get into Acts. Remember, the guy falls asleep and falls out of the, the second story. So you church sleepers, I'm just, I'm, <laughs> you do with that what you want. But, um, but they're, they're, there they are, the three of them, right? In, in, and there's this glorious event that's taking place, the once in a lifetime, this glimpse of what Jesus, the glory of Jesus is like prior to him humiliating himself, humbling himself, and walking this earth as God's son. And they're asleep. But, but when they wake up, Peter says this, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. So what does Peter want to do? He wants to stay. He, he, he sleeps through the beginning of it, but when he wakes up and realizes what's taking place, that, that, that this, the, the pinnacle, at least for the moment of his, in his mind, of, of who Jesus is and what he is about, he, he doesn't want to go away, right? I mean, as much as, as the disciples can be boneheaded, they know what this means. When you're standing there and you have Moses on one side and Elijah on the other, when you have the law and the prophets and you're in the middle, what does that mean? To what did all the law point? To what did all the prophets point? Yeah. I mean, they, they, they may have not understood what he was talking about when he, he talked about um, being the Messiah, taking up the cross. None of that might have made any sense, but they know what this scene means. And they, mean, they know that this is something that almost no one has ever seen or will ever see. And so we can grant Peter some grace, right? They want to stay there, right? Master, it's good for us to be here. Let's build three tents, right? The guys who couldn't even stay awake now are, are contractors, and they're going to start, they're start building. But they can't, can they? They can't stay there. 
and we're told this, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And there's a couple of interesting things about this. Um, if, you are, uh, if you know your Old Testament, you know that lots of good things, major things, actually Old Testament and New Testament, anytime you go to a mountain, something's going to happen, right? Just a reminder, Nebraska people, nothing happens where it's flat. <laughs> good things happen where there's mountains. But anyway, um, if there's a mountain, something good's going to happen. Like Moses getting to see the promised land. Or like Moses being given the Ten Commandments. Do you remember what what it was like on top of the mountain while Moses got the Ten Commandments? Covered in a cloud. Old Testament, cloud, darkness, sometimes fire, lightning is combined with it. That's actually always used to, to talk about the presence of God. So beyond just the disciples up there experiencing Jesus revealed in his glory, what it'll be like when he is triumphant, they are actually hear the voice of God. They're in the presence of God speaking to them, right? And what he says is, well, I don't know what you think. This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. I think there's a, a couple of interesting things that are going on here. One is this. I mean, if you ever got to, like, have God talk to you, you'd want him to answer some, like, deep, deep questions, wouldn't you? like the nature of the universe or, or, or why they're suffering or these sort of things. But, but in some ways, bear with me, this almost would be disappointing, wouldn't it? Because what God says is, listen to Jesus. To which they would say, well, that's what we've been doing. And that's what we're going to do. But, but even no matter how they might react to it or, or might have reacted to it or how me, we might react to it, it's actually what, quite profound. What God is saying is the answer to all of your questions, anything you might ask me, any conversation we might have that, that, that about what you struggle with or the answers you need, when you're, when you're there staring at the abyss, when you don't know how to face the next day, when, you, when you're on your knees and you're crying out to God and you just don't know what, what is even the right thing to do, what is the right thing to ask, his answer is the same. Jesus. It is his son. And in this moment, they get to see this, this bright glimpse of what the future will be like. But they don't get to stay there. They have to go back down the mountain. They have to go from Colorado to Nebraska or something. Um, but, but isn't that our life as well? I mean, we experience these moments, we have these times, we have these glimpses of, of, of just great, great moments in our life, right? And it could be different for all of us, but, but we still have to go back to real life. We can't always live in, in these glorious moments. But the question is that I, and this is maybe just the weird way my mind works, I have always wondered, at least prior to the Holy Spirit on Pentecost for the disciples, what did they make of that? As the rest of the events unfold of, of Jesus' ministry, as they see him, you know, dark times coming where, where he's going to be arrested and betrayed and put to death, what did they, what did they make of that day? Was it something that they, they couldn't process and so they just put away? Was it something they, they looked at and, and gave them hope? Hard to say. But I do believe that answers the question of why Luke tells us the story. As a reminder to the, the original readers, but also to us as well, that, that that which we experience is never the end of the story. That this picture that the disciples get is actually a picture of the end game, uh, of Jesus winning and reigning in heaven. Having died for our sins, having risen again to give us new life, and having ascended that he might give us everlasting life. They get a, a little picture of that, and, and so do we. Um, I don't know about you, but I, as I get older, I have these kind of weird, um, I don't even know how to describe it, the kind of these, these bookend experiences in my life, right? Where I'm taking my daughter to visit a college, and I can still see myself holding her as a little baby, right? I can... Um, 
I remember sitting on my grandmother's lap in the moments when I am sitting at her deathbed. We have these, these interesting kind of, it's where the past and the future are coming together. And, and it's really quite profound. I'll see, uh, I'll see my daughter walk around in church, you know, maybe coming down the aisle to do something, and, and all of a sudden I'm in the future, and there. I'm walking her down the aisle for something else. Or sitting in a hospital room with them when there's a new baby. We, we do this more than we realize. That we, 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 there, there's a future that we long for that sees us through. And while that's a very human and natural thing to do, the, the thing the scriptures hold out for us is something even more profound. We do actually have a picture of the future. We know how it ends. So that even when we turn on the news or open our social media and, or, or get our notice on our phone that the world is just an absolute dumpster fire, we still know how it ends. We know how it turns out. And the answer to all of our questions remains the same. This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Amen. I want to share with you this week's uh, generosity moment. It's actually... Um, our... Um, for a number of years, you might have heard about uh, best practices. This is something we've gone to. Uh, some group of us, pastors and others, have gone for over nine years. We um, have started last, no, some years ago, we started supporting them financially. Some years after that, we actually started presenting. And this year, we actually got to go out and help them uh, get ready for it. And it was just a great event, um, one that we love putting on. 2,300 other um, Lutherans from all over the country come to, to be blessed, to be energized, to be encouraged. And so we got to help out with that. So particularly help, uh, we thank Alexi, Katie, Julie, Mark uh, for heading out there and, and helping PJ come out and join us as well. Um, it was rejuvenating, uplifting, encouraging, fun, and they learned a lot. And one of my favorite things that the staff learned, let me just tell you this real quick, is they got to, to meet the head pastor who puts this on. And he, this is what it was like. Have you seen the movie Apollo 13? Where, where he sits him in the room and he says, here's all the stuff, all the stuff in this room is what we have to get the astronauts down, make it happen. He put us in a room and said, uh, here's, I, I want a balloon drop of 4,000 balloons. Here's the balloons. Oh, and I need it tomorrow. <laughs> um, so it was lots of fun, but it also made the staff thankful for because I, I, I give them like two weeks notice for something crazy like that. Right? But anyway, so as God is generous in our lives, we're generous in the lives of others, and we thank him with our offering. again today to welcome some new members so Steve and Linda you can come forward oh, you guys saw you guys somewhere that is uh, uh, Carol Liefker here this morning it might be 1030 all right oh there you are all right
right. I think the, the rest of the people will be here at 10.30, so um, the opportunity to give you guys a chance to confess your faith, uh, a reminder uh, for the congregation of uh, the faith that we confess as followers of Jesus. Beloved in the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ said to his apostles, whoever confesses me before men, I will also confess before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Lift up your hearts, therefore, to God of grace, and joyfully give answer to what I ask you now in the name of the Lord. You this day, in the presence of God in this congregation, acknowledge the gifts that God gave you in baptism. So answer, yes, I do. Do you renounce the devil and all of his works and all of his ways? So, yes, I renounce them. Do you believe in God the Father Almighty and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, and in the Holy Spirit? If so, answer yes. And do you hold all the prophetic and apostolic scriptures to be the inspired word of God, and the doctrine of the evangelical Lutheran Church drawn from them, confessed in the small catechism to be faithful and true? If so, I do. And do you intend but to hear the word of God and to receive the Lord's Supper faithfully? If so, I do by the grace of God. And do you intend to live according to the word of God in faith, word, and deed, to remain true to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, even to death? If so, I do by the grace of God. Do you intend to continue steadfast in the confession and church and to suffer all, even death, rather than fall away from it? If so, I do. And you desire to become a member of this congregation. That we support the work of our Lord Jesus Christ that has given this congregation with your prayers and the gifts that God has given you. So I will with the help of God. So, so upon this, your confession of faith, I acknowledge that you are members of the Evangelical Lutheran Church and of this congregation. Receive the Lord's Supper and participate with us in all the blessings of salvation that the Lord has given to his church. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your great goodness in bringing these, your sons and daughters, to the knowledge of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, enabling them both with the heart to believe and the mouth to confess your saving name. Grant that by your word and spirit they continue steadfast in the one true faith and the fellowship of this congregation. As together we await the day when all who have fought the good fight of faith shall receive the crown of righteousness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So you guys can turn around and we can uh, welcome them. <laughs> Steve, Linda, and Carol. All right. We'll join in prayers if you please would rise. I was going to make sure we prayed for Ukraine today, but we have like uh, four requests for Ukraine, so <laughs> make sure to include them. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for the opportunity again to gather as your people, to be encouraged and to be fed with your scriptures, reminded of the future glory that awaits us and all who long for your appearing in your victory, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you have already given us a glimpse of the glory that it will be so amazing that will probably leave us speechless as you left the disciples amazed at your majesty. So we pray, Lord, that the knowledge of your uh, victory, the knowledge of your glory, would encourage us in all of our trials and tribulations in this life, in the moments when we feel uh, all is lost or there is no hope, that you would remind us again, Lord, that you have already begun and already won. And you have joined us together through holy baptism and faith in that victory. We pray, Lord Jesus, for our church. And remember today, especially Christopher Asti and family, Vince Asti and family, the Osterman family, the Babcock family, Gethsemane Lutheran and North Glen, all the churches around the world, Lord, as they fight the good fight of faith. We give thanks today for... Uh, Jane's granddaughter, Cheyenne, and a, also a great granddaughter, Nova Jean, who were born yesterday. 
We ask that you would watch over them, that they may look, grow up to live a godly life in uh, your praise and glory. And we pray for Spencer, who's getting married to Nicole on March 19th. Uh, we pray that you would bless that and that it would be a marriage that holds you at the center. We pray for uh, blessing and direction for their new family. And uh, they also moved here recently from California. We pray that you would bless their transition. We pray for all those who are sick and suffering, Lord. Remember uh, the crisis, especially in U Ukraine and the war, that you would watch over them and bring peace and protection. We pray for uh, the hindrance or uh, an escalation <clears throat> that uh, uh, this wouldn't be uh, something that, that gets worse, Lord, but that you would bring resolution and peace. We pray for the Mueller's and the healing for their family and friends. <clears throat> we pray um, for the daughter of a family friend, Lucy, who's battling leukemia. Needs a bone marrow transplant. We pray for um, Strong in Cambodia and that you would continue to watch over their ministry, especially uh, as they continue to battle COVID without vaccines. We pray for all the victims of human trafficking. We pray for Heather Pretzer, uh, that you would bring relief to all of her pain and suffering. We also uh, pray for 14 year old Everett who is going through cancer. And we pray for healing and restoration in our body and soul and comfort for the family and friends. Anything else, uh, Lord, we bring before you now on the silence of our hearts. All these prayers and the unspoken ones we bring before you, Lord, knowing that you are risen and ascended, Lord, and Savior continue to hear and intercede for us. We ask you, Lord, to remember us in your kingdom and to teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine in you, be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Is that for closing him?
Oh, good. Even more of this. I can't wait. Uh, some things to remind you of. Ash Wednesday is coming up uh, this Wednesday, March 2nd. Uh, that'll be the imposition of ashes with communion, and we'll have a meal prior to that at 6 o'clock, and that will continue during the season of Lent. All of our Wednesdays will have worship at 7 o'clock uh, with a meal prior to that at 6 p.m. Despite what you experienced this past week, spring is coming. And uh, so it's time to think about community gardens again. If you want to reserve one of yours, talk to uh, Jeff Beerman or talk to us in the office. We'll get you set up for that. I uh, also want to let you know that as we're heading into Lent and Easter, uh, our desire here is to kind to return to return to even more of our normal. And so that means uh, going back to the rail at both of our services for communion, but also offering our individual and common cup again. But in order to do that, we need a couple of different things. One is we need uh, some more communion assistance. And so if you were doing that before and got out of the habit and can help, we would appreciate it as well. We also need, uh, the Altar Guild needs help. If you don't know who the Altar Guild is, they're the wonderful people who help support worship, as like I like to say, uh, and the things that you can see and touch, right? The banners, the lighting, the, uh, but especially the, the Lord's Supper, the elements there. So we need help in that area. Uh, we do want to, and we think that people, there'll still be some people who are more comfortable with the prepackaged communion, so we want to be able to offer all of those. So the biggest need we might have is we need someone who's good at um, handy with their hands, woodcrafting, who might make us some trays that would hold those. Uh, so if you have any interest in helping us out and that, let us know as well. What have you got? I'm actually afraid to hear what you have got. <laughs> I just have a few announcements. Uh, one is that we still have the Lent devotions. If you haven't picked them up, there's two more actual packets that have kid crafts in them, or you can just grab the devotion. Uh, it's for the Signs of Lent series that's going to start on Wednesday night following PJ's Wednesday night sermons. Um, so be sure to pick those up. Also wanted to let you know that today is the last day to vote for Save It or Shave It. Okay? It is the last day. So I've been harassing a lot of you to wear your stickers, but I've heard that a lot of you still don't know what side you're on, or you've told me you're neutral. You can't be neutral anymore. You gotta pick a side. So we had our teens weigh in on whether or not they think he should save it or shave it. Hi, I'm Kaylin. Hi, my name is Brennan. Hi, my name is Jacob. Hi, my name is Ian. I think he should. I think he should. And I think he should. And I think he should. Shave it. Save it. Shave it. Save it. Because it's been a while since I've seen Pastor Jacoby's clean face, and I think he needs a change. Because I think it's a good look on him. I didn't think that far <laughs> yet. <laughs> because I've never seen Pastor with a clean face, personally. And I want to see that happen. I think, as well, it is a very good look for him. And as long as it's not all gruffy, he pulls it off. All right, so make your decision today. Vote for Save It or Shave It. Uh, Shave It is currently in the lead by about $300, but Save It could come back. I'm hoping it doesn't. So vote Shave It. All right. So um, I just want to put another announcement out there for Camp Summit. We do have a, a registration open, so if you know anyone that you think would enjoy Camp Summit, um, please send them to our website. It's an easy sign-up process. We have three camps. We are still looking for a few more volunteers. And then if you also... Um, you could volunteer yourself as a shepherd. We're looking for more people there, youth and adults. You can also support Camp Summit through the Encore program to assist with snacks. So if, if that's the option you'd be interested in, um, get in, get in yeah, contact with Lexi for that. Okay, you guys have a great morning. What fun today, right? I had a fun time today. <laughs> Yeah, it was every, really good. Every Sunday. So anyway, um, keep up to date with everything that's going on via our email, website, social media. Contact us if you have any uh, needs in the office. And uh, go in peace. Serve the Lord. <laughs>